When a woman's body washes up on a Florida beach, no one is more shocked than the police. I have never in my life seen anything like this before. The Navy thinks her husband's best friend is the killer, but a psychic disagrees. The man's innocent. How many times can you say, I, it wasn't me, I didn't do anything? A psychic connects with the dead. He's going to kill me. Will her message be enough to save an innocent man from life in prison? On the northeast coast of Florida, Jacksonville is home to the Mayport Naval Station, the third largest U.S. naval base in the world. We live in a, a large military town, and uh, we had two aircraft carriers, and you could tell when they were out to sea, that was 10,000 people gone from your population. On the morning of March 26, 1988, two fishermen make a grisly discovery. They find a body washed up on the intercoastal waterway. They thought it was a dolphin. They thought it was a fish that had washed up on the beach. Dave Archer is a detective with the Atlantic Beach Police. When he arrives at the scene, he immediately knows this is no simple drowning. I could tell it was that of a white female. Her hands were tied behind her back with a fishing stringer. And I thought, OK, that's odd. She's identified as 22-year-old Anita Lukander. She had been reported missing by her co-workers at the Navy base nine days earlier. She was in my duty section, and she didn't show up for work. And in the Navy, you show up for work. Peter Johnstone was a co-worker and a close friend of the Lukanders. When he'd realized Anita was missing, and knowing her husband was away at sea, he and fellow workers began a citywide search. I mean, everybody, you know, we all gotten worried. I mean, even the Navy had gotten hold of her husband, Bill, who was, I believe, down in Guantanamo Bay at the time. My chief brought me down to the chief's mess and actually spent about four hours with me talking and uh, settling me down. And you know, nah, I won't forget that night. The autopsy suggests Anita's body had been in the water for nine days. She was gagged with a white T-shirt. She had been strangled, and her body had been mutilated. I said, do you think she was raped? And he said, I can't tell. I said, what do you mean you can't tell? He said, all that's been surgically removed. And I thought, what? The medical examiner also notes that her left ear had been cut off. I told my boss, I said, look, I am entirely out of my league on this one. I have never in my life seen anything like this before. Because of the shocking nature of the crime, they call in both state and federal law enforcement agencies, including the FBI. And Atlantic Beach at the time was a small town, a small police force. I don't think they were used to homicide investigations. And honestly, I don't think it was really taken seriously until uh, Anita's body was found. When investigators initially searched the Lukander home, the front door was unlocked. There was no sign of forced entry. It just looked like a normal apartment. I'm thinking we got another missing military wife. You know, she's probably took off with somebody, or who knows. Three days later, Anita's truck was found parked at a local bar just four miles from the house. When Bill Lukander arrives home from sea, he notices right away that something is wrong. Some of his guns are missing from his cabinet. Police immediately check pawn shops in the area, and one dealer says someone tried to sell him the stolen guns. A composite sketch of the suspect is made, but it leads nowhere and is filed away. We start out with everybody was a suspect. In fact, the insurance company called me and said, we're fixing to pay off on the Lukander case, but we want to know if the husband is a suspect, because if he is, we're not going to pay. And I told him, I said, lady, at this point, he's the only one that's not a suspect. And the reason he's not is because he was out of the country. A month later, a bizarre discovery. A mailman finds Anita's wallet. Sitting on top of it, a cold glass of water. No fingerprints are found on the wallet or the glass. We took that as like a, a sign saying, OK, you guys, are, you guys are getting cold. You're headed in the wrong direction. You need to go back the other way. The next day, Anita's purse is discovered blocks away from the Lukander home and on the same street as Bill's best friend, Peter Johnstone. 
Friends say that Johnstone spent a lot of time at the Lucander home, especially when his good friend Bill was away at sea. Well, when Bill was gone, yeah, I would hang out over there. It wasn't as, not hardly as much as I did when Bill was there. To investigators, John Stone is beginning to look suspicious. Every time you turn around, bam, Peter, Peter John Stone is standing right there looking at you. How's it going, guys? Is there anything I, I could do for you? No, we're, we're on an active homicide investigation right now. There's nothing you can do for us unless you did it. Peter takes two polygraph tests. The first is inconclusive. The second one, he passes. I never felt concerned that they were investigating me. I never felt concerned with that. Always, anything I could do to help. Peter remains a suspect, but with no new witnesses, no physical evidence, the police don't have enough to make a case. Everything was circumstantial. There was no smoking gun. There was no fingerprint to say, this is this and this is that. I just couldn't do it. Nine months after Anita was murdered, police are still no closer to catching her killer. We would pretty much hit a, a dead end. The Anita Lukander case goes cold. Seven years pass without a single lead, and Anita's brutal killer is still out there. Between 1988 and 1995, I was very frustrated, angry. I was still basically living and working with the same group of folks, and pretty much realized that, you know, there was probably somebody in that group that had killed Anita. Then, in 1995, the Naval Criminal Investigation Services sets up a cold case unit, and the Anita Lukander case starts to warm up again. They go back to the original suspect list from 1989. At the top is Peter Johnstone, who is now married with two children and no longer in the Navy. Two agents visit him in his home in Maryland. You know, they just want to ask me a few questions, and all oh, the case had been brought back up. And just in a split second, it turned ugly, and they said, you did it. We know you did it. You are the one, and you have you better tell us now. And, and once again, I was just flabbergasted. Investigators grilled Johnstone for a full three days. Now, in a dramatic turnaround, they believe they have the evidence they need to nail him. He's taken into custody and held for 30 days until the Florida Duval County Grand Jury indicts the former Navy Squadron member for the murder of Anita Lukander. Mimi Hannon, an investigator for the Public Defender's Office, is assigned the case. We had a man that probably didn't commit this homicide, and it was our job to prove that. For the defense, seven years after the murder, it was going to be tough going. So breaking with convention, they turned to a psychic for help. But could a psychic's cryptic clues help save Peter Johnstone from life in prison? It's been seven years since Anita Lukander's mutilated body washed up on the intercoastal waterway in Jacksonville, Florida. Her co-worker, former Navy Petty Officer Peter Johnstone, is charged with murdering his best friend's wife. How many times can you say, I, it wasn't me, I didn't do anything? There was no physical evidence really linking Peter to the crime. Uh, the only thing that linked him to Anita Lukander was his friendship with her, his uh, business acquaintanceship with her, and uh, you know his friendship with her husband. Anne Finnell and Pat McGinnis are Peter Johnstone's public defense lawyers. Perhaps Peter Johnstone was an easy person to focus in on because he co was cooperative with them. The most damning evidence the Navy had was a supposed verbal confession given by Peter Johnstone during their three-day interrogation of him in Maryland. After I was arrested, I spent 30 days in um, Maryland jail awaiting uh, paperwork from Florida because I was arrested under a fugitive, for, fugitive from justice for murder. And uh, when I got to Florida is when I met my attorney uh, Pat McGinnis, and they said that I had confessed. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't confess to anything. I kept telling them no for two and a half days. And apparently they had this whole confession that they wrote up. Nothing I wrote up, nothing I signed, nothing I said, no, nothing. The false confession that Peter ultimately gave was, um, you know, Basically, if I'd have done this, here's what I would have done. Naval investigators contend that Peter Johnstone made advances to Anita, which she rejected. Angry, he strangles her, panics, and steals the guns from the cabinet to make it look like a burglary. 
He then dumps the guns and Anita Lukander's body off the bridge into the intercoastal waterway. Most people don't believe that anyone would ever confess to something they didn't do. Those instances where interrogations last for long periods of time, the likelihood of a false confession is, is real, is real. And in Peter Johnston's case, this went on for three days. Now it's up to the defense team to build a case for Peter Johnstone's innocence. Investigator Mimi Hannon's task is to go back seven years to the original 1988 investigation. Law enforcement in this case botched up an investigation tremendously. And it was a cold case. So you're going back and witnesses forget and people die and they move. And it's just really hard to reconstruct a real solid defense from something that had that happened so, so long ago. To bolster their case, Hannon makes an unusual suggestion. It occurred to me that law enforcement utilizes psychics. The government has utilized psychics. And back in the 90s, people weren't very forthcoming about using psychics to help them solve mysteries. When I first mentioned to Pat and Ann that I had a psychic friend and I would like to run the case by her and see if she had any feedback, they were very skeptical. Patrick almost did it, I, I felt, just to humor me. Um, but I wasn't going to put my professional reputation on the line. I believed in Sharon's ability and was looking forward to using it. Sharon Johns is a psychic who lives in Gainesville, Georgia. She says her psychic ability comes from a higher being. I always pray to work from that highest level. And by doing that, the, the angels and the guides do come and stand with you because you're working in that light. I ask for extremely accurate, accurate information for those that I read for this day. When I get information, it just comes in words, just kind of quick words, or in a video, or just in kind of symbols. Hannon and the psychic are friends, but they've never worked together until now. I do all of my work over the phone because I prefer to be in my space. If I'm sitting beside a person, I have to move away from them. And um, I'm just more comfortable to do phone work. I don't care if the person lives next door. I'll say, no, call me on the phone. Because that way, my uh, energy is more clear. Sure, no when problem. Mimi calls Sharon Johns, she has no knowledge of the case and asks Mimi not to give her any. She wanted to know the victim's name and date of birth and Peter's name and date of birth. Peter and that's Johnson. all I gave her. Immediately before she could even get his name out, I said, the man's innocent. She told me that Peter would be found innocent and that the jury would come back in with an acquittal in March. When I look at different the aspects of what's going on, things just come immediately. With this case, it was just like a TV reel, you know, just taking place. Then Sharon inexplicably hones in on a curious clue. I keep getting this about a composite somewhere. And you really need um, to see if somebody can find it. How could Sharon know about the seven-year-old long-lost composite, the sketch of the man who tried to sell the stolen guns? And why does she think it's so significant? The composite had not been found yet. We had so many volumes of discovery to go through that we intentionally had to start searching through the discovery boxes. And we eventually did find it. It was there, just as she said. I came back to the office the next morning, and Pat wanted to know what the psychic said. And his eyes got big as saucers. There were views she had about the case and expressed that we were quite frankly puzzled as to how she could have arrived at those without a more intimate knowledge of the case than she had. We had Pat's attention. He was going to take her more seriously than he had. Sharon Johns was suggestive that this was in fact the uh, person who was Anita Luke Anders' killer. And the composite picture doesn't look anything like Peter Johnstone. When I first saw the police sketch of the composite, oh, I didn't think it, I don't think it looked like me at all. One, I think the person had hair. And uh, I haven't, uh, I'd like to show you some pictures of me back then. I haven't lost much hair since, you know, in 20 years. And not to mention, you know, I'm not wearing my glasses now. But back then, I always wore glasses. So, I mean, without bumping into a wall, no, didn't look a lot like me at all. As we began to work on the case and went further and further into things, then I saw more and more. Patrick had asked me to ask Sharon a series of questions. He wanted them tape recorded so that it would be the exact words of Sharon Johns. During my conversation, her voice started to go from her own voice 
to the voice of somebody else. As well as seeing visions, Sharon claims she is a channeler. It's a phenomena that allows spirits to communicate with the living. It was really sort of a surprise to me, too, in that I wasn't really, what you're saying, preparing for this. The voice was very high-pitched. It sounded like a little girl's voice. He's going to kill me. I don't know where Sharon went, but I was talking to somebody else. Can a psychic channeling the voice of a dead woman help change the course of justice? A sailor accused of killing his best friend's wife is about to go on trial. You did it. We know you did it. It was... You gotta be kidding me. When a psychic is asked to help on the case, she says he's innocent. It's like I saw the whole thing just unfold, like a video. And now, in one of her sessions, she claims to channel the voice of the murder victim, Anita Lukander. She started talking in first person about the crime, and she walked me through the crime as it happened. When I'm really into a trans channel, I, I am moved completely out of the way to the point that I don't have any idea of what is being said. It's going to kill Mimi tells me that it was a high-pitched little voice. She sounded like a little child. The voice sounded scared and frightened and had expressed that to me, that she was held for days and he would leave her there alone for hours at a time, bound. And she knew that he was gonna kill her. And I'll never forget the last words this voice said was, and then it was done. And I took that to mean, and then he killed me. I'd never been a part of something like that before. So at that point, I went over to jail, and I pulled Peter out. And I said, Peter, Peter, what did Anita sound like? And he said, you couldn't mistake in her voice. She sounded just like a little girl. It's like she is the one that showed me herself um, in that chat that she was in. And by her coming through, and actually speaking was amazing in that um, the people that were listening to it heard it, but the recording didn't record it. There was nothing on it but static, and there was a lot of distortion on the tape. If the psychic's revelations are accurate, Anita was held captive for several days before being tossed into the waterway. And if this is true, the prosecution's contention that her body had been in the water nine days must be false. When we looked at the autopsy results and the photographs, both Mr. McGinnis and I were very suspicious of the body having, having been in the water for that full nine-day period. And the reason being is that in the intercoastal waterway, even in March, uh, there's a lot of crab activity. To prove their theory, the defense team order a crab test at the same location where Anita's body was found. In the experiment, raw chicken is used in place of human flesh and is placed at the bottom of the river for nine days. While that body is on the bottom especially, it would be attacked by crabs and other animals that are in the water as well. This body had no, none of that kind of activity. If crabs didn't ravage Anita's body, it could only mean that she was not in the waterway for the full nine days. This contradicts the Navy's contention that Peter killed Anita and dumped her body that same night. It makes the so-called confession meaningless and amazingly vindicates the word of a psychic. February 18th, 1997. Almost nine years after Anita Lukander's brutal murder, Peter Johnstone goes on trial. Peter was definitely fearful facing trial because he was looking at a life sentence. He had been behind bars for almost 20 months by the time he had gone to trial. But just as the trial gets underway, the psychic makes an unusual request. Mimi called me and she says, uh, is there anything else that we need to do? We're going to trial. I said, just be sure that you've got that composite. I said, it's very important. I don't know why, but you've got to take it. We had no idea where she was going with that and what the significance would be. Anne Fennell enters the composite sketch into evidence, and it will prove to be pivotal. Trials don't always end up like you want them to end up. It is a, an incredible nerve-wracking experience, much more so than if you're going to trial with someone who you either know or think is guilty. After a three-week trial, the jury begins their deliberations. 
Just two hours in, the jury requests to see the composite sketch of the man who pawned the guns once again. And we found out there was one holdout in that jury room who uh, wanted to take a closer look at Peter Johnstone. One hour later, the jury reaches a verdict. My heart was, you know, coming out of my chest, and you're just sitting there, and the judge takes a piece of paper, and he reads it, and I'm like, okay. And then he folds it back up, and he hands it back. It was a real nail-biter for a few minutes until the jury was seated, and the clerk read the verdict. With the jury found the defendant not guilty, so say it all. A not guilty verdict in the death of his best friend's wife, Anita Lukander, who was raped, strangled, and mutilated in 1988. On March 17, 1997, just as the psychic predicted, Peter Johnstone walked out of the Jacksonville courtroom a free man. How did the psychic know so much? She said that the key to Peter's defense lay in the composite sketch. She predicted that he would be free in March, and she correctly predicted that Anita had not been thrown straight into the water after the murder, as the prosecution stated. Sharon's contribution to the case had become huge. She invigorated the defense team. We were on a certain defense theories that was what Sharon was seeing, too. It got him looking at other avenues and justifying what she had said. It was great. So I think she, uh, good chance she saved my life. Today, 21 years after Anita Lukander was murdered, Sharon Johns and Peter Johnstone meet for the first time. Oh. You look good. You look good. It has. Oh. It's so you're welcome. You're welcome. Oh. Doing this work is a res big responsibility. I have simply just learned to trust. And what I see, I give. I can't give them any more than what I see or what I hear. To date, the cold-blooded killer of Anita Lukander has never been brought to justice. She was my wife. She's a daughter. She was a sister, an aunt. And there's only really one person that knows what happened to Anita. And that person needs to come forward and put this to rest. And if he's not man enough to do that, personally, I hope his life's a little